My name is Professor Mary Riley and I'm head of the Peripheral Nerve Research Section in the National Hospital of Neurology, Queen's Square, London. And I have a particular interest in the inherited neuropathies, including TTR amyloidosis. And TTR amyloidosis neuropathy is what my talk is going to be about today. I'm very grateful for the invitation and delighted to have the opportunity to talk. So uh, neuropathy and TTR amyloidosis is an important topic and TTR amyloidosis is one of a group of conditions which are called the amyloidosis and it's a difficult term to understand but it's where you have a protein deposited where it shouldn't be and the protein is insoluble. So if you look at a normal nerve here you have the normal nerve fascicles but if you look at this nerve, all of this pink stuff is actually amyloid. So that means it's a protein and that protein cannot be dissolved. So in the case of TTR amyloidosis, the protein is TTR, all the other proteins can form amyloid as well. And as you can imagine, if we think of any part of the body that gradually gets replaced by this amyloid, you can understand why that particular part of the body wouldn't work properly. And in this case, we mean nerves. So when talking about TTR amyloidosis, the disease was originally described in 1952 by Andrade in Portuguese patients. And at that stage, it was called familial amyloid polyneuropathy, which is a name that many of you may know it by. And I want to focus on a couple of the original descriptions, which still are very important. Most patients with TTR amyloidosis have a genetic form where there is a problem with one copy of the two copies of the TTR gene, which can be inherited in a family such that children of a person with this condition have a 50% chance of inheriting the gene. Some patients do not have a mutation of the TTR in that the normal TTR protein can be deposited later in life particularly in the heart. But today I'm really going to focus on the genetic form because that is the commonest form to cause a neuropathy. So in TTR amyloidosis, a neuropathy and a cardiomyopathy are the commonest features. So that is amyloid being deposited in the nervous system and in the heart. And although as you can see from this diagram, there are many other parts of the body that can be affected by TTR amyloidosis. The nerves and the heart are the main parts that are involved. And why is the neuropathy important? Well, the neuropathy is important because it is a major feature of the disease, but also there are now a number of different therapies for TTR amyloidosis. Many people will have heard that liver transplant was used a lot, but less so now, and there are different drugs in development or in use. But the really new kids on the block, the big players are the gene silencing drugs. These are the drugs that silence TTR and reduce the expression of the TTR. And these have now had clinical trials done and have been shown to help patients with TTR amyloidosis. But certainly in the UK and in many other countries, they're only licensed for patients who have the neuropathy. So therefore, when patients have a diagnosis of TTR amyloidosis, we now need to diagnose the neuropathy as early as possible because the evidence is, evidence is that treating the neuropathy early is the best way to do it because it prevents damage. So when we talk about a neuropathy, what we mean is the involvement of the peripheral nervous system. So we have a brain and a spinal cord that make up the central nervous system and in the vast majority of people, this is not involved in TTR amyloidosis. But the peripheral nerve system, that is the nerves in the arms and legs are. And there are two types of peripheral nerves, sensory nerves and motor nerves. So if somebody touches your skin and you, get, you feel the touch, that message is relayed through the sensory nerves up to the spinal cord 
and then up to the brain where you perceive the feeling of touch. Whereas if you want to move a muscle, say perhaps a hand, the brain gives the message to the spinal cord and then that is relayed through a motor nerve down to the muscle that you want to move. So in TTR amyloidosis, both the sensory nerves and the motor nerves are involved. And if you look at a bundle of nerves, this is what it looks like. Individual fascicles of nerves and blood vessels to feed the nerve. And this is an example of a nerve biopsy from a person who doesn't have a neuropathy. And as you can see, it's very like the diagram. Here are the nerve fascicles and here is the blood vessel. And if you look at this in higher resolution, you can begin to see the individual nerves, which are axons surrounded by myelin, and even higher if you look at the nerve here. So each of these axons is filled with proteins and then surrounded by stuff called myelin. So it's a bit like a pipe with lagging. The size of the message is determined by the axon, but the speed of the message is determined by the myelin. So most motor and sensory fibers are these myelinated fibers. But as you will see in the normal person, there are some fibers which don't have myelin. They're called unmyelinated fibers, so they're just axons. And those axons are really important because these unmyelinated fibers are the critical fibers for pain and for burning and tingling sensations. And they are the fibers that are first involved in most people with TTR amyloidosis. And just to remind you of what that is, this is the normal nerve again, and this is the amyloid deposition in the nerve. So I hope you now have a better appreciation how if you get this amyloid between the nerve fascicles, it will interfere with normal function. The nervous system has a second part of the, of the peripheral nervous system, and that's called the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is shown here, and it basically is to do with everything that happens automatically without us thinking it through. And I tend to think of the autonomic nervous system as the part of us that does things automatically. So, if you are in a car, you often get to the stage where you're driving the car without thinking about what you're doing. It has become automatic. And our autonomic nervous system really deals with a lot of the nervous control of our systems that's automatic. And to list a few of these that are important in amyloid, the control of our blood pressure, our heart rate control, many of the control of our urinary function, that is passing water, the control of our bowels, and the control of erections, all of this is to a certain extent under the autonomic nervous system. There are other functions under it as well, but I'm only going to deal with these ones today. So that's another part of the nervous system. And people sometimes talk about an autonomic neuropathy and a peripheral neuropathy. And often when people say peripheral neuropathy, they can mean both. So they're very interrelated. And the nerves in the autonomic nervous system tend to be these small unmyelinated nerves. So they are the smaller type of nerves. I'm just going to mention one other thing to do with the nervous system, which is not a neuropathy. It's what we call a connective tissue disorder, and that is carpal tunnel syndrome, because this is very common in amyloid. So in your wrist, and I'm aware of saying anything about wrists or hand surgery with Carlos um, in the audience, but you do have a nerve called the median nerve, which supplies sensation to your thumb, second, third, and half your fourth finger, and supplies some movement, particularly of the thumb, and that's an important nerve. Now with carpal tunnel syndrome, it's not that you have a problem in the nerve, it's that the nerve becomes pressurized by this, what we call a, a ligament. So it puts pressure on the nerve and the pressure on the nerve causes these symptoms. And in amyloidosis, what you find is amyloid deposits in the connective tissue. So not in the nerve, but in the connective tissue. So the classical symptoms will be waking up in the middle of the night with a tingling numb hand, or when you're driving or holding a book or using a scissors. So that's what carpal tunnel syndrome is. And we know it's very common in certain forms of TTR amyloid, both the wild type and in some forms of the hereditary tribe, it can be seen in up to 70% of patients. And it's much more commonly bilateral, that is both hands, than in the normal population where it's more commonly just one hand but neither of those rules are absolute. 
Now, moving on to TTR amyloidosis, now there are multiple different mutations, and I'm only going to mention very few of them. Of course, the commonest is what's called the TTR MET30 mutation. It was originally described in Portugal in 1952, but there are big clusters in Sweden, in Japan, in Brazil, but also there, there are individual patients in many other countries, including the UK. So this is the commonest gene that has spread around the world, but also the commonest mutation that occurs independently in different populations. So it is common. Patients are usually, particularly in the Portuguese patients, younger when they get the disease, 20s, 30s, and it's often predominantly neuropathy. Patients in other countries, including the UK and France, can get it older. The second one I'm going to mention is the Irish gene because it's common in England. This gene arose in Northwest Ireland, and this gene causes a neuropathy and cardiomyopathy with an average age of onset about 60, 61. And in the UK, of those patients with a neuropathy, this doesn't include the cardiomyopathy alone patients, about half of them have the Irish mutation, a smaller percentage the methionine 30, and then there's many other mutations we see. So in the UK, because of the immigration from Ireland, we have a different group of patients than say in France, Portugal, or even the US. It's, it's a group that's really quite unique in the mutation spectrum, which is why some of the treatments that have evolved over the years are different. For instance, we have a much lower rate in the UK of doing liver transplants because patients with the Irish mutation didn't do well with that compared to countries like Portugal, where they had a younger group with the methionine 30 mutation. And you'll see many pictures like this showing the spread of mutations. And here we see the Portuguese one, which is usually early onset and neurological, whereas there's one called the 122 isoleucine, which is a, one that predominantly causes a cardiomyopathy in older people. And I have put the Irish one, I know it's here, but I've changed it and put it bang in the middle because it tends to cause a neuropathy and cardiomyopathy. And a little over 50% of people present with the heart and about 50% with the neuropathy. So it does vary how people present, but often when they're investigated, they're found to have both involved. So I think that's slightly different. And there's different mutations that people may have that do different things. Again, to stress the wild type, is usually a cardiac predominant disease, as is the vas visoleucine 122. Those are two that are predominantly cardiac. So in terms of the neuropathy, what is it like? Well, it tends to start usually in the sensory nerves first and then involve the motor nerves. There's exceptions to all of that, but the classic TTR neuropathy starts in the sensory nerves. And usually it involves the very small fibers that are unmyelinated, that is those pain fibers. So it's very common to present with pain or burning in your feet. You can accompany electric shock-like feelings, knife-like feeling, tingling, pins and needles. And we call all of those positive sensory symptoms, not that they're good, but they're producing something that isn't there. Whereas with time, you get a much larger component of the symptoms due to lack of feeling and numbness, which we call a negative feeling. And that's due to involving the large myelinated fibers. And if you have lack of feeling, you can become increasingly unsteady walking because you don't know where your feet are unless you're looking at them. You can begin to drop objects out of your hands because again, you don't quite know what your hand is feeling. And you can develop complications of not being able to feel like ulcers, cellulitis and infections, particularly of your feet. Your hands you see more, but your feet you don't. For instance, I have a patient who was in Portugal, not recently, as nobody was away recently, but who was playing golf on AstroTurf and burned his feet on the AstroTurf without having noticed it. With time, the motor becomes involved. And when the nerves to muscles are involved, they cause wasting of the muscle and weakness. And again, it's usually feet, then legs, hands, then arms. And as you get weaker, you may initially just need insoles to help your walking, then splints, walking sticks, and up to a wheelchair. And in the hands, the hands may become weak first and then the arms. Occasionally, people get the weakness in the top of their legs first, and that's due to a, com a complex involvement of muscle and nerve, which I won't dwell on today. And 
When we talk about feet being involved first, we call that a length-dependent neuropathy. Length-dependent means the longest nerves involved first and worst. So in an average person, the longest nerve would be the nerve to their toes, muscles from their spinal cord. So in a six foot man, that nerve is about a meter long. So usually with both the sensory involvement and the motor, it starts in the feet. And usually we say by the time the numbness gets to mid calf, you began to get symptoms in your hands. And it's the same with the weakness. Now, clearly, if you've carpal tunnel syndrome, that may have come earlier and that's separate. But that's what we mean by length dependent. Now, sometimes with teach your amyloid, it starts in the hands. Sometimes you weaken the top of the legs first. Sometimes it starts with weakness rather than problems feeling. And in my experience, the younger you are when you get it, the more likely you get pain first. But the older you are, so people with the Irish mutation and other mutations, they don't get as much of the pain first and they may just get the weakness and numbness. So there are the issue about diagnosis is it actually can present in almost any way it wants to neuropathy wise. And what I've just described is the classical presentation that I'm sure some of you on the call at least will recognize. In terms of the autonomic, now this is where it can get difficult from a diagnostic point of view because the autonomic nervous system affects the whole body and therefore people can present in multiple different ways. I find one of the commonest problems in men is erectile dysfunction, but the problem is that can have multiple other causes and it wouldn't be top of any GP's list to have TTR amyloid at the top of their list for that and nor should it be. A common symptom with the amyloid involvement of the autonomic nervous system is called postural hypotension. That is, as you stand up, you feel faint. And especially if you stand up quickly, and that can lead you to feel dizzy, faint, or have a blackout. In terms of the heart rate, you can get irregularities leading to dizziness and heart block leading to blackouts, eventually needing a pacemaker or defibrillator. Again, the autonomic nervous system is very important in controlling urinary and bowel functions. So it's not uncommon to have some urgency pass and watering, even some incontinence and to get urinary tract infections. And the bowel problems can be very problematic. Commonly, it's alternating diarrhea and constipation. It may start with diarrhea during the night, which is unusual. And actually, the diarrhea can be very troublesome for patients in terms of moving outside the house and working. And with all of that, you can get dramatic weight loss. The autonomic nervous system has a very complex role to play in TTR amyloidosis. And even though once we know the diagnosis, we're very good at picking up all of these, if a patient presents with any of these on their own to a doctor, it can be difficult initially to pick up that this is due to TTR amyloid because they're so diverse the symptoms. So, you know, people going to their GP feeling dizzy, that's such a common complaint, probably most commonly due to a mixture of drugs people are given for other conditions, that it can be quite difficult to dissect down into this. So how do we treat it? So if we don't treat TTR amyloidosis, as everyone on the call will know, it is a progressive disease without treatment. So the neuropathy progresses in the way I have just described without treatment. And the way to treat this disease in 2020 is to give a definitive treatment. So many things have been used over the years, including liver transplantation for many years, particularly in the methionine 30. And many people on the call will be on or have been on Dipinazole and some people on Dipamidus. And then there are newer drugs in development, which I won't touch on because they're mainly for the cardiomyopathy. But the game changers in the last few years has been the gene silencing drugs. So the treatment we would say is to have gene silencing drugs for the neuropathy. But clearly right now, we have a mixture of patients who are literally just beginning to get symptoms going on the gene silencing drugs. And then we have patients who've had their symptoms for many years on the gene silencing drugs who already have an established neuropathy. And perhaps with these drugs are really aiming at getting a stabilization rather than a dramatic improvement. So we have a spectrum of patients being treated. So as well as the definitive treatments, we need to remember there's many different symptomatic treatments that can be used for the neuropathy. 
So first of all, going back to carpal tunnel syndrome, many patients have mild symptoms and don't need specific treatment. And in my um, experience, the most likely symptom to respond to treatment is the symptom of what we call positively sensory symptoms. So the pain and tingling that can come on during the night, first thing in the morning, or repeatedly during the day. And if you need treatment, some people respond to just having splints at night, other people need steroid injections, and many people have an operation just to cut the, the ligament and to give some space, which is very successful in patients with those symptoms of positively sensory. And sometimes we take the opportunity of doing a biopsy of the ligament to find the amyloid if we need tissue. So carpal tunnel syndrome is something that is very easily treated. It doesn't matter that it's due to amyloid. It can be treated and should be treated if necessary. In terms of the pain, the pain is treated like any nerve pain that is neuropathic pain with one big exception. Patients with TTR or amyloidosis often have other problems such as heart problems, and they may have other systems involved. So every drug that is prescribed for any condition they have, it has to be taken, the decision to give it in combination with all of the other problems the patient has. So we cannot prescribe drugs for pain if they might make the heart worse. So all of it has to be done individualized for the patients. Some patients find very simple analgesia like paracetamol helps. Often patients use the drugs that were originally developed for epilepsy, such as gabapentin and pregabalin. They can be quite useful for patients with TTR amyloidosis. The other group that is useful is a group of drugs that were developed for depression, such as amitriptyline and nortriptyline, and a newer drug called duloxetine, which was developed for diabetic neuropathy. These are all helpful, but these two particularly can affect heart rhythm. So again, if they're going to be prescribed, it needs to be discussed with the doctors who can after the cardiomyopathy if the patient has one to make sure they're suitable. Amitriptyline can make patients quite sleepy. So nortriptyline is almost the same drug with less sleepiness. But and I use that quite a lot. It is more expensive, which is why people are often prescribed this one first. And then there's a group of drugs that I have found useful called lidocaine patches, which are local anesthetic patches which people don't often think of if you've got a generalized neuropathic pain. But if the pain is worse in particular areas like feet, these are patches that are put on for 12 hours overnight and then taken off during the day and can be very helpful, particularly in patients who have difficulty tolerating drugs or have difficulty having many of these drugs due to other um, complications medically. And opiates, that is morphine and morphine-like derivatives are used in a small group of patients Particularly, we're a little reluctant to use them in some patients because they can be very constipating, but some people find, for instance, codeine a good painkiller and the little bit of constipation to cause, they find it good for the diarrhea. So again, it's a matter of individualizing the actual drug for that particular patient. In terms of the sensory complications, these actually are very important. If we don't, if someone is very numb, they can get ulcers, these can turn nasty and become infected, we can have osteomyelitis, which is infection of the bone, and sometimes we can have, you know, the toe falling off. So these are just complications that can occur unless you have very good care. And the way to manage those, it's all about education, and a nurse specialist do that. It's educating people to look at their feet night and day, and never to put their feet against hot water bodies. In countries which are hot, not walking on hot sand, and other very simple measures. Foot care is incredibly important. So regular podiatry or chiropathy is incredibly important to keep the nails and everything in pristine condition. And with your hands, particularly if you do something like cooking a lot, it is actually finding a way of protecting your hands. So maybe heat resistant gloves or other things. Again, with your feet, you might have excellent orthosis for your weakness, but if you don't feel well, they may dig into your skin. So again, it's working to get that right. So you can avoid 100% almost of sensory complications with good care. And obviously in countries where you go barefoot more, it's more difficult. So we would say a lot of our patients have to be more careful in the summer than in the winter. But that is extremely important. In terms of the weakness, unfortunately, there is no specific drug that can be given to make muscles stronger if it's due to a motor nerve problem unless you're treating the underlying disease. 
but you know patients it's really important people avoid falls because falls clearly are not good with all the complications so various aids are used in terms of various type of foot retosis various type of shoes sticks wheelchairs when necessary and all of this is done by physiotherapists or occupational therapists depending on who's available people often ask about exercise and over the years in many neuromuscular conditions we have shown that exercise is helpful now it will not bring back muscle function that is wasted due to a damaged nerve, but it keeps people supple and often the other muscles, which are not as badly affected or perhaps not affected at all, it can optimize the strength in those. But again, it has to be done in an individualized fashion because of the patients who have cardiac problems or severe autonomic problems. So an average patient that comes into clinic and says, I find it difficult to walk more than 100 yards. We then dissect out, is it the neuropathy that's stopping them walking? Is it the parathesis due to the cardiac disease? Or is it actually the autonomic neuropathy that they're walking fine on the flat, but when they go up a little incline, they get slightly dizzy in their head? And all of that needs to be taken into account in design of therapy. So there's no point in someone pounding themselves in the gym if their blood pressure control is so poor that they won't tolerate that. So again, it's individualized. In terms of the autonomic system, there is a lot that can be done symptomatically. So there are many treatments available for erectile dysfunction. And again, these have to be taken in conjunction with the cardiac disease because some of them are drugs that can affect cardiac function. Many patients with advice can control their postural hypertension by learning to get up slowly, by learning leg exercises, and by learning food control. If not, there are drugs that help, but there is a tension in the advice. People will often want you to drink a little bit more for the postural hypertension, but if you have heart failure, they may not want you to have a little bit of fluid on board. So again, it's a balance between the different systems, but there are drugs that can be effective. Similarly with the heart, the heart can be due to the autonomic nervous system or due to the heart problems that Julie will talk about, but patients do not uncommonly need pacemakers, etc. There are drugs available for the urinary problems and occasionally people need to self-catheterize if they have recurrent infections and that all can be managed. I think the bowel problems can be very, very tricky. Some people manage them well with some codeine. There are other medications used. There are injections that can be used such, such as octreotide and there are even nerve stimulation called posterior tibial nerve stimulation that can be used. But we do tend to get specialist help from gastroenterologists and gastroneurologists because we find sometimes that the bowel problem from the autonomic neuropathy has meant the bowel doesn't operate properly. And then you get secondary problems like what's called bacterial overgrowth. So you get bacteria in the bowel that need different treatments. So sometimes that does need investigation to find out what particular part of the bowel problem is causing the problem for the patient. And managing the bowel problem is very important for the patient because we do want to avoid weight loss. And sometimes that's really difficult to get right because it can be really difficult to manage all of that. Now, there are other problems people get, problems with not feeling hungry, feeling they can only eat small amounts often and therefore not getting the calories in. But there are a lot that can be done to manage the autonomic neuropathy complications. And of course, one of the things that we're talking about now is just to finish off is we really need to be better at diagnosing earlier because of the therapies available and all of the evidence that's accumulating suggests that if we treat earlier, we prevent problems. So the importance of earlier diagnosis is not only for the patients, but for their at-risk relatives. So for the patients, as a neurologist, there's a list of things we think of in terms of diagnosis. But the top one is to have a clinical suspicion. If you do not think of the diagnosis, you won't make it. And the red flags to a neurologist are a classic neuropathy with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, with autonomic involvement, as long as the patient doesn't have diabetes, because that can cause both, or with a pacemaker. And in the UK, we would think anyone Irish from Donegal or Portuguese. Now, clearly, we do see it in other populations, but we do think of it particularly with these red flags. That would be my red flags in clinic for all patients. We then have to confirm the neuropathy, and that's pretty easy. So the history is often given as a clue. We then examine the patient, and we can find classical findings. 
And then we do nerve conductor studies. And many of you may have seen an EMG machine where we use a machine to measure the conduction of nerves. And then this gives us graphs where we can see the size of the nerve amplitudes. We can also look at the small fibers by doing special temperature testing, although that's not quite as accurate or as reliable because it depends on the patient telling us do they feel something or not. So it's what we call a subjective test. The patient tells us the result rather than us objectively seeing it. We do do nerve biopsies sometimes to prove the neuropathy was due to amyloid. We don't have to do those often, but we do particularly if it's a patient who doesn't come from a family known to have it and where tissue in anywhere else is not showing it. And when we do, we can, in about 70% of patients, pick up the amyloid as shown here and as I've shown earlier. They can be useful. But it is patchily deposited, so we can miss it. So it's not 100% diagnostic. And then I've starred a few things. These are the things we're looking at in more detail to get earlier diagnosis, but at the moment, they're not, their value isn't confirmed but being explored. So we can do skin boxes to look for neuropathy. So this is a normal patient, and these are the small, what we call unmyelinated nerve fibers that go to the skin and detect and produce pain if they're not working. And this is a patient in this case has a diabetic neuropathy with no fibers. But telling us this neuropathy does not tell us it's due to amyloid, but it's still useful at confirming a neuropathy if all the other tests were negative. But there is work going on that has shown that you can actually also find amyloid in the skin as well as the neuropathy. But we yet don't know whether you will find the amyloid earlier than the other tests we do for neuropathy. So therefore, is it worth doing skin biopsies before any symptoms? We don't know the answer to that yet. Similarly, people are developing MRI. Now this is of a tiny nerve called the sural nerve in your foot. This is not easy to image. And of course, any of us writing papers pick our very best image and it looks beautiful. But in real life, this is difficult. So this is the sural nerve of a normal person. This is an asymptomatic carrier of the mutation. That is before they develop symptoms. And this is someone with TT or amyloid. And you can see a difference. So as the MRI scans get better and they are newer scans that are much more powerful, three or four of them in the UK now available, I do think we'll be able to image the inside of nerves. You can see the individual fascicles here much better in the future, <clears throat> but this is still in development. And then another thing which my group have been <coughs> involved in is looking at markers of axonal damage. So if you look at the axons here, these little tiny dots represent proteins in the axons. And one of the most important groups of proteins in normal axons are called neurofilaments. And one of these called the neurofilament light chain, we know and have shown in other diseases involving nerves, other kinds of neuropathies, that neurofilament, you can detect it in blood as the axon breaks down. And about two years ago, we showed that in other inherited neuropathies that you can detect it. And last year, we showed that neurofilament light chain is raised in patients with TTR neuropathy. But since we've published this paper, another group in Italy have shown that it may be that neurofilament does go up before you develop any other signs of the neuropathy. And it has been shown in the Batisseran trial that if you treat with the gene silencing, the neurofilament goes down. So we're currently exploring whether this simple blood test will be a good way of seeing if the neuropathy is about to start and maybe even in the future of making decisions to treat patients when this starts elevating before any signs of neuropathy occur. But as I said, this is a currently under exploration. In terms of the autonomic neuropathy, there are many different treatments, as I've mentioned before, but one of the problems is the diagnosis. Once we know there's TT or amyloid, it's very easy to do various tests to explore all these symptoms. But as I said, if you present to your doctor one of these, it is more difficult. And in my experience, one of the most difficult areas is with your bowel problems. If somebody goes to a GP with diarrhea and constipation, you should not think the TTR is the top of the diagnostic list because it will not be. There are other diseases much more likely. But I think this is one of the symptoms that causes the longest delayed diagnosis. And in the UK, many people have biopsies of various bits of their bowel and don't get a stain done for amyloid as part of routinely. And that to me is something 
that needs to change. I think the heart is much better because of MRI being good at people picking up TTR and Julie will discuss that. That's much better, but this is still the major area where I think things are missed. Once we diagnose the neuropathy, do the genetic testing is very straightforward at the moment. It's not a difficult test to do. But what's changed in our practice since the advent of treatments is testing much earlier and testing at risk relatives. So I would say we now have got to the stage where we're testing all undiagnosed neuropathies for TTR. Now, in our practice here, we haven't found any that we didn't suspect, but that's because we've had the luck of being able to do TTR testing for a couple of decades. But I do know in various series from around the world that if people test 100 to 150 patients, they usually do find one or two patients undiagnosed. So I think it is justified in all undiagnosed neuropathies to screen for TTR because it is a treatable disease now. That certainly is something that has changed in UK practice in the last year or so. And then what about at-risk relatives? So in the past, if patients said to us, will we tell our children to get tested, particularly say a patient in their 50s and their children are in their 20s. And we would have said, of course, it's good to have genetic counselling with your children to make up their own minds, but there wouldn't have been any pressure or any particular reason to be tested many decades before the disease started. We know that it depends on the mutation in your family when the age of onset is likely to be. And now we have a much more emphasis on telling patients proactively about the disease and suggesting the family have genetic counselling. Now, genetic counselling doesn't mean they have a genetic test, it means it's discussed. And then if they do have testing, we can organise mutation and age-specific screening. For instance, someone with the Irish mutation, if they get a predictive test done in their 20s or 30s, they may only be seen once every five years. But by the time they hit their 40s, they may be seen more, more quickly. And in the future, if we have blood tests like the neurofilament, we may have a different way of tracking them. So that is something which has changed in terms of our advice. This is just a couple of references of things we've written last year, guidance to both the diagnosis and to the various ways the neuropathy can present. And this is our neuromuscular group in Queen Square. I just want to mention a couple of other consultant colleagues that run TTR Amyloid Clinics with me. Alex Ross are here. Tilda Laura here and Ashley Carra here and my other neuropathy colleagues Mike Lon and Hattie Manji see many patients as well and we have nurse specialists and therapists and geneticists etc there and these are just to acknowledge some of the research fellows that work on MTTR um, particularly Mahuna um, before and Antonia Anton Carroll recently and um, so thank you very much I hope that's at least um, answered some of the questions on the neuropathy and given you an overview thank you <laughs>